Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, an evolutionary psychologist, which means that I'm interested in human nature. I'm especially interested in the nature of human children and most especially in those aspects of children's nature which came about in the course of natural selection to serve the function of their education. And really that's all aspects of, of, of children's nature. The um, big idea that I'm here to talk about today is that children are biologically designed to educate themselves. They, their natural curiosity, their playfulness, their natural sociability were shaped over the course of millennia by natural selection to serve the function of their education. A corollary of this idea is that we don't have to educate them. I'm sort of the subversive in this group. We don't have to have schools as we think of them. We don't have to take adult responsibility for educating them. All we have to do is provide them the conditions that allow them to educate themselves. We need to get out of their way. We need to provide the conditions that allow them to educate themselves. Many of you right now are thinking I'm crazy. And I assure you that I'm not. This is something that I've devoted a great deal of study and time to. This idea is something that has a great deal of empirical evidence for it. I describe the evidence fully in my book. And here I have just a few minutes to convince you that it's an idea that's at least worth thinking about. One way that I have looked into this idea is to uh, investigate how children in hunter-gatherer cultures become educated. As most of you know, through most of human history, we were all hunter-gatherers. Uh, some groups of hunter-gatherers managed to survive into modern times, relatively modern times, and have been studied by anthropologists. So a few years ago, a graduate student of mine and I uh, identified 10 rather prominent anthropologists who among them had lived in seven different hunter-gatherer cultures on three different continents and we interviewed them about the lives of children in the culture that they observed. And what we found was remarkably similar for every one of these cultures. In every one of these cultures, the anthropologist told us, the children were allowed to play and explore, generally away from adults, no adult intervention, no adult coercion, from dawn to dusk, from the age of about four on into their late, mid to late teenage years, basically what we would think of as school years. And the reason that they did this is partly because they feel that it's not anybody's right to tell somebody else what to do, and that's what children do, but also because they recognize that that's how children become educated. They play and explore in ways in which they are teaching themselves the skills, they're practicing the knowledge that it takes to become an adult in the culture. I'm convinced that children come into the world biologically designed to look around and see what it is that I have to learn to be a successful person in this culture into which I am born. So in the hunter-gatherer culture, the children are playing at hunting, they're playing at tracking, they're playing at building dugout canoes, they're playing the musical instruments, and they're playing at the dances and the games of their culture. And as they grow up, they become, these activities become increasingly productive and they gradually merge from the play of children to the actual productive work of adults, but still in a very, very playful spirit. All of the anthropologists told us in one way or another that they had never seen such happy, self-reliant, resilient children before. And I believe that the reason they are all of this is because of the freedom that they're allowed. This is the way children grew up through at least 99% of human history. So what happened? What happened? The first thing that happened was agriculture. With agriculture came land ownership. 
with land ownership came status differences, hierarchy. Some people owned land, some people didn't own land, and they were dependent upon those who did own land. They had to become servants, slaves, to people who owned land. We entered a different kind of world. Suddenly now, if you were in the majority of people who's, were, who were basically a servant, think of feudal times, where all the land was owned by a relatively small number of people, and basically everybody else was some kind of a servant to those people. You're not going to raise children in a way that fosters free will. You're going to raise children in a way that suppresses free will, so they will be good servants. Obedience is the primary goal of education in this post, in, in this post hunter gatherer world. Now the point I want to make here is that our schools, what we call our modern schools, arose out of this history. The first systems of compulsory schooling were very deliberately designed to suppress free will. They were very deliberately designed to indoctrinate children, initially because the first schools were Protestant schools in Protestant gospel. Subsequently, after the schools were taken over by the states, the indoctrination was more in the gospel of the state rather than of the church. If there's a father of modern day schooling, it's August Hermann Franke in Prussia, who established the, first, the world's first widespread system of compulsory schooling. And it was very clear to, in his writing what the purpose of these schools was. So here's a quote from his handbook of, uh, in, of his instructions to, to Prussian schoolmasters. Above all, it is necessary to break the natural willfulness of the child, while the schoolmaster who seeks to make the child more learned is to be commended, he has not done enough. He has forgotten his most important task, namely that of making the will obedient. This system of, of schooling spread throughout Europe into the colonies in America. Everybody was trying to emulate the Prussian system. Uh, in, uh, in England, it was uh, John Wesley, the Protestant leader John Wesley, set up schools. In his uh, rules for Wesleyan schools, he wrote, as we have no play days, so neither do we, have, do we allow any time for play on any day, for he that plays as a child will play as a man. The goal of school was not happiness, it was to suppress happiness. Happiness was the handmaiden of the devil. Free will was the handmaiden of the devil. So, I'm going to just back up for just a second. So, what can we do about this? The problem is that we have inherited this kind of school system that was set up by Frankie and others is still the school system we have today. You could have walked into Frankie's schools and you would clearly recognize it as a school. The children are sitting in rows. They're learning lessons being taught by the master. They're all learning the same lessons at the same time. The job is to feed it back. And the motivation for doing it is to get a reward or to avoid punishment. None of this is taking place in the sense of captivating the child's natural curiosity and the child's natural playfulness. It's all designed to suppress those things. This is not the kind of school you would set up if your goal were not obedience training and indoctrination. If your goal were to foster creativity, if your goal were to create critical thinkers, if your goal were to create creative people, you would not develop a school that looked anything like Frankie's school. And it wouldn't look anything like the schools that are now the descendants of Frankie's schools that we now have. What might that school look like? What happens is that for many years I've been conducting research at a school that was designed from scratch in an entirely different way from Frankie's model of a school, from the model of a school that we call today traditional schooling. This, this school happens to be the Sudbury Valley School. It's not a new school. It was founded almost 50 years ago in Framingham, Massachusetts. It has currently 160 students who range in age from four into their late teens. It has seven adult staff members. 
It's non-selective. Anybody can go there. Uh, it is inexpensive. It uh, operates on a per-pupil budget that's less than half of what the local state-supported schools operate on. So this is not elite or expensive education. Now, the interesting things about the school have to do with the way it is administered and with the uh, educational philosophy. So the school is administered as a democratic, uh, as a participatory democracy. Uh, all the rules of the school are made by uh, vote at the school meeting, uh, which operates by Robert's Rules of Order. It's a rather formal meeting. The school meeting really, truly makes all the rules of the school. And if you violate a rule, you're brought up to the judicial committee, which is basically a form of uh, jury. So the school, in a sense, operates in the ideal way that American democracy is supposed to operate. And children are therefore growing up, not just hearing about democracy, but actually practicing democracy at the school. The educational philosophy is basically that of a hunter-gatherer band. The idea is that if children are provided with plenty of free time, plenty of opportunity to explore, to pursue their own interests, they will become educated. The staff there don't call themselves teachers. They don't consider themselves responsible for the children's education. They believe the children are responsible to educate themselves. So if you were to walk through the school at any given time of day, you would rarely find anything that looks like a class. You would see things like this. You might see children who are, uh, who are creating something in the uh, art room or the, or, the, or the woodworking shop or children playing music or drawing playfully on a blackboard or cooking something in the kitchen or playing or working at computers outdoors. You might see scenes like this, uh, kids playing uh, strumming on a guitar or just talking and laughing, playing some sport on an open field, climbing on structures, fishing in the pond, ice skating on that same pond during the winter. The key to learning at this school is free age mixing. The children are never segregated by age. They interact regularly across age. They all, uh, every day, they're involved with kids who are much younger as well as much older than themselves. The younger children are constantly learning from the older ones. They see what the older ones do and they want to be able to do those things. They see older children reading books and talking about books and the younger kids want to read. That becomes their motivation to read. They want to join that club of people who read books. They're playing games that involve things like reading and numbers and various other uh, uh, valued cultural activities and the kids who don't know how to do that are learning how to do it in the context of playing with older kids who know how to do this. Uh, the, the advantage of age mixing goes both ways because while the younger children are acquiring advanced skills and knowledge from the older children, the older children are learning a sense of their own maturity and the ability to uh, to, to, they realize they can nurture, they can help, they can lead. There's gaining something at least as important from their interactions with younger children as the younger children are gaining from interactions with them. Now the best evidence that this school works as an educational institution comes from studies of the school's graduates. I was involved in conducting one of those studies many years ago, which we uh, published in the American Journal of Education. And what that study showed was that the graduates of this school, even those who've never taken a course, never read a textbook, don't have any difficulty going on to higher education if they choose to do so. In fact, it looks to me like they have an advantage going on because they have gained a kind of inner drive to figure out what it is they have to do to achieve the goals that they want to achieve. They've taken control of their own life, something that so many of the other students entering college have not done. We found that they, they've gone into the whole range of careers. Uh, and one interesting finding, a very interesting finding to me, was that a large percentage of them 
were pursuing careers in adulthood that were direct extensions of the kinds of things that they played passionately at when they were children. So for example, one who, was, uh, who loved to build things as a child at the school was now a machinist and an inventor. Another who loved boats was now captain of a cruise ship. Another who, as a little girl, sewed doll clothes was now a pattern maker in the high fashion dress industry. Another who loved computers had founded his own software company and actually was making a lot of money at that. Uh, another who enjoyed, for some reason, he got into mathematical puzzles and games and he loved mathematics, is now a professor of mathematics. I could go on and on and on. You know, we talk about children, about pursuing your passions, but how do you find your passions? How can you find them if all you do in school and so much of your time is taken with school is what other people are telling you to do and you don't have time to really pursue your own interests and discover those passions. I should say that since my study, two further studies of the school have been conducted, the graduates of the school have been conducted with similar results. The Sudbury Valley model is replicable. It's, uh, there are now something like 40 Sudbury model schools uh, throughout the world, mostly in the United States, but some in other places. There are kids who have come from these schools from a wide variety of socioeconomic backgrounds. There seems to be all the whole normal range of personality types. And I don't see any evidence that there are some groups for which it doesn't work. So what are the conditions that optimize self-directed education? These, I think, are the conditions that are similar between Sudbury Valley School and a hunter-gatherer band. And I think what Sudbury Valley does is it provides these conditions which allow children to educate themselves very effectively. I don't have much time, so I'm gonna run through this very, very quickly. First is a clear understanding that education is children's responsibility. When they know it's their responsibility, they take that responsibility. When we act as if it's our responsibility, they give it up. Unlimited opportunity to play, explore, pursue own interests. You need time. You need time to try many different things. You need time to get bored. You need time to overcome boredom. You need time to immerse yourself without bells or anything to stop you in those things that you love to do opportunity to play with the tools of the culture. And by play with the tools of the culture, I mean be creative with those tools. Do your own thing with those tools. Really figure out how to use those tools to do what you want them to do. In a hunter-gatherer culture, the tools are bows and arrows and digging sticks and dugout canoes. In our culture, there are things like computers and books and cooking equipment and so on and so forth. And at this school, the children can really play with these things. Access to a variety of caring adults who are helpers, not judges. You can't really seek help fully from somebody who is also judging you because that person makes you anxious. You can't, you always kind of go into impression management mode with somebody who is evaluating you. So the staff members at a Sudbury school and the adults in a hunter-gatherer culture are not evaluating kids. They're not measuring them, they're not comparing them. Free age mixing, I already talked about. Immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. This, because of this, children are growing up not just feeling responsible for themselves, but feeling responsible for others and the community too. Now what I want you to notice is that none of these conditions exist in our standard schools, none of them. We take all of the conditions away that children need in order to educate themselves and then we, very inefficiently, very, very expensively, and with considerable pain, try to educate them. We handicap the whole educational process by creating the, the Frankie-type schools which were designed not for education as we conceive of it today, but were designed for indoctrination and obedience training. I am absolutely convinced that someday people will look back and they'll wonder 
why human beings ever thought that coercion is essential for education, or that standardization, in which everybody's supposed to learn the same thing, is a good idea. Whoever came up with that idea? I'm trying to tell you who came up with that idea. <laughs> so here's the question. If Guernsey is going to be the happiest place on Earth, it's got to start with schools being the happiest place for children to be. No place in the world are schools the happiest place for children to be, generally. And in fact, studies in the United States and elsewhere show that children are less happy in school than in any other setting in which they regularly find themselves. We adults often delude ourselves into thinking that children like school and that they're happy in school. But when you do the actual studies, and these have been done in a careful way, especially when you're looking at middle school students and high school students, you find that they're less happy, more anxious, more bored, in school than in any other setting in which they find themselves. Is this where they should be educating themselves? So this is my challenge. If I believe that if you could create schools in Guernsey where children can truly learn in their natural ways, you will have happy children, you will have happy adults, and everybody will be very well educated. Thank you very, very much.